I had a different direction I had planned on going with today's message, but for some reason I felt compelled to address the current situation that we're going through. COVID-19 has now dominated our news feeds for over two months. I mean, we had it in the news prior to that, but for the past two months, it seems like that's all we hear of. In fact, on the way into the church the other day, I was listening to the news on my way in, and out of seven news articles that came up, six of them were directly related to COVID-19. The other one had something to do with something happening in the technical world um, and didn't. But I'm getting tired, probably like you, of hearing COVID-19, coronavirus, shutdowns. I'm just ready for this thing to be over. Here in the state of Washington, we've been in some state of shutdown for seven weeks. If I remember correctly, it started with just the schools being shut down, uh, but even that was supposed to be only temporary. And then within a couple of weeks, it seems like everything shut down. In the beginning of the crisis, even though it was an inconvenience, the general consensus was, we're in this together. We'll get through it. But as the shutdown continues and it gets added extended time, over and over, tensions are beginning to rise. Even though the federal and state governments are trying to help ease the economic impact on families and individuals, it isn't enough. People are worried about how they're going to pay their bills and feed their families. And now this week, we're hearing a possible meat shortage as processing plants close. Are we ever really going to see the end of this? And then when we see some states starting to open back up and and other states that never did shut down, but they're not any worse off than we are. People start thinking, what's going on here in our state? When we thought things would get better quickly, we were patient. But each day seems to add another worry, another layer to the mounting problems. Even those who may not have liked or agreed with certain decisions were able to go with the flow for a few weeks. But you can only keep things bottled up for so long. Fuses have gotten short. And tempers are beginning to flare. I'm sure it'll come as no surprise to any of you when I say that there are two completely opposite extremes when it comes to the issue that we're facing. On one side, you have those who believe that this could be the end of civilization as we know it, or possibly even the end of civilization altogether. And then on the other side, you have those that believe everybody's making a big deal about nothing. And then, of course, there are people who fall anywhere in between those two extremes. To make matters worse, even the medical professionals, government officials, etc., can't seem to agree. I, as well as many of you, have read and listened to some medical experts who are operating in panic mode. And then you listen to others who claim that COVID-19 is no worse than the flu that we go through every year, although it does affect certain people worse. So who's telling the truth and who's filling our heads with lies? Well, a lot of that depends on which side of the spectrum you naturally gravitate to. Are you a natural optimist or are you a natural pessimist? Some people will always gravitate to the worst case scenario. It doesn't matter what issue we're talking about. They're always going to go worst case. And then there are others who will always see a light at the end of the tunnel and say, you know what? This may not be good, but we're going to get through this. I see a light. Many people have asked me where I stand on the issue at hand. I have deliberately kept my opinions to myself especially when it comes to making a public statement. Because I know that no matter what I say, I'm going to offend somebody. Somebody is not going to like where I stand on the issue. They're going to think I should be with them. It's like they're, you can't have a middle of the ground. You have to have an opinion one way or another. And if you have the middle of the ground, they want to talk you into going to their extreme. I will unashamedly preach the gospel and take the risk of offending someone when it comes to that. Because the gospel is important enough, and I know that some people will not accept the message, and they will get offended, even though I'm preaching the truth from God's word. But when it comes to some of these other issues, it's not worth creating an argument. It's not worth offending somebody. It's not worth losing a friendship. And this week, I have heard of friendships that have been dissolved because people couldn't agree on the issues, and they argued, and it finally came to a head, and somebody ended up blocking somebody on Facebook or, or saying, don't call me anymore. It's not worth fighting about. Even in our church, there are people on both sides of the issue when it comes to the COVID-19 crisis. There are some that think we're overreacting and they can't understand why we're not having church as usual. Why do we have to do this online thing? Why don't we just meet? Some of them feel the government is overreaching and taking away our freedom of religion. 
Others feel that it would be putting our congregation and themselves at risk. And they accuse us of not really loving people. If we did decide to meet, well, you must not really love people because you don't care if they get sick. Even when restrictions are lifted to a certain extent, it's going to be impossible to please everyone. Some people are going to say it's too early to meet in groups. We don't care what the government says. It's not safe. We shouldn't meet. We should still keep doing this online thing. Others are going to say it's about time. This was way past due. In a way, I'm glad that so far most of the decisions are out of my hands. They're just kind of dictated to me, and I don't have a lot of choice in some of them. Because once we're allowed to meet in person again, no matter what I and the board decide to do, there are going to be some who think we made an unwise decision. Now, let me go on record by saying this. I think that there are very few people, if any. Now, notice I said few. There could be somebody. But I, I think there are very few people that are deliberately trying to destroy the country or trying to make things worse. Because that's one of the things that people are talking about. This person's deliberately trying to ruin things. This person's deliberately trying to ruin my livelihood. This person's deliberately trying to close down the churches. I don't think there's very many people that are deliberately trying to do anything. I think most people that are making decisions are trying to do the best they can with the information, with the data that they have. I may not agree with every decision that's being made, but I think they're trying to do their best. Everybody says they're relying on data. Well, which data are you listening to? You can hear data from both sides. And which interpretation of that data? Because most data can be interpreted two different ways. But the way I interpret the data is going to decide what I think should be done through the situation. Yes, some people are, in my opinion, listening to the wrong voices interpreting data incorrectly. However, that's just my opinion, and I don't claim to be an expert in any of this. We all like to have some control over our destiny. We like to at least feel like we know what the future holds. We want to be able to make decisions that move us forward towards the future that we see. Right now, it can easily appear that we've lost control. And worse yet, it appears that no one is really in control. But you know what? Sometimes that's the best place to start. When we finally realize that no one is in control, it should cause us to turn to the one that is in control. There are some things that we will never be able to figure out on our own, and some things that are beyond all the wisdom of men. If you took all the wisdom of the world combined together, there are some things that are beyond that. It takes a higher power. It takes someone who truly does know everything. Only God can solve many of our problems. But why is God often the last one that we turn to? The biggest problem facing many right now is not the virus. It's the impact that the virus has had on their finances. Many people are looking to someone else to take care of them or playing the blame game because someone isn't doing enough to take care of them. Our currency here in America is printed with the words, In God We Trust. Do we really believe that? Does our provision come from God? Or does our provision come from our employer? Does our provision come from God? Or does our provision come from the government? Are we completely in charge of our own provision? Some people would say, well, if you can't provide, then it's your fault. You need to find some way of doing it. Our employment is a tool that God can use to provide for us. And in times like these, the government can step in and help make up at least a portion of what we're losing. We can make wise or unwise decisions when it comes to stewarding what we have been given. But do we believe that ultimately, whatever happens, God is in control? It's God we need to trust to take care of us. We're listening to what everyone else says about whether or not we should stay home, wear gloves and masks, etc. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't protect ourselves, but do we put more trust in others and what they think or in our personal safety things that we're wearing than we do in God? Do we really believe that God is ultimately the one who will protect us? If we get sick, who's the first person we're going to call? Will it be God or will it be 911? 
God often uses the medical profession to help bring healing. But do we put more trust in them than we do in God? Do we really believe that God is our ultimate healer? Why is God often the last resort instead of the first resort? When we face these devastating circumstances, is our default fear or is our default trust? Psalms 91 verse 2 says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. I'm not going to trust in myself. I'm not going to trust in the government. I'm not going to trust in my friends. I ultimately trust in God. There are a lot of things that are out of our control. Many of them are out of our control because we don't have the right authority or the right knowledge. And if I don't have the knowledge, I can't make the decisions on my own. I need somebody else to make those decisions. If I don't have the right authority, even if I think I have the right decision, I can't carry it out because I'm not authorized to do that. But there are some things that nobody here on earth controls. Only God controls them. I want to talk today about some of the things that we can control and some of the things that we can't. First, let's look at things that are out of our control. Our crisis or our circumstances, for the most part. From time to time, we find ourselves in the middle of a crisis. At least we think it's a crisis. Sometimes it's a crisis that we have created on our own because of poor choices that we've made. But more often than not, it was something that was totally out of our control. None of us caused this crisis that we're going through right now. It just happened and it affects us all. Even with the things that happened because of our poor decisions, though, by the time it gets to crisis mode, we feel like we've lost control. We might have had a little control up to that point, but now it's like out of our control. So what do we do when we have a crisis? Do we look for someone to blame for the crisis? Do we worry about how we're going to get out of the crisis? Do we vent to the world about how uncomfortable we are and complain about our situation? Do we wait for someone else to get us out of the crisis? Or do we immediately turn it over to God? Philippians 4, 6, I used this a few weeks ago in my message. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, even the bad ones, By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on Him, or sometimes it's say worry. Cast all your worry on Him because He cares for you. So we can't control our circumstances, our crisis. Another thing we can't control, we can't control other people's reactions or attitudes. I really can't control what you're going to think through this crisis we're going through. I really can't control how you're going to react to it. And when I try to force someone else to react a certain way or to think the way that I think, I'm actually making matters worse. I've seen a lot of people do that by trying to put it out for the world. This is how I feel. I'm not afraid. I'm going out in public. If you feel safe going out in public, go out in public. But why do you have to parade that around on Facebook or somewhere where it's going to offend someone else who takes the other side of the issue? And I don't even know for sure who's right and who's wrong in this situation. You need to do what you feel is best for you. You react the way you react. Now, we're going to talk about some of the ways we react in a little bit, and there are some ways we should and we shouldn't. But you can control your actions. You can't control somebody else's. We usually can't even hold somebody responsible for their reactions. Often, we can learn from what someone else does. Sometimes we learn how we should respond We say, I don't want to act like that. Other times we say, hey, I like the way they handle that situation. I think I can try that next time. But worrying about what somebody else is or is not doing or trying to change them seldom solves the problem. 
It simply make things worse. A third thing we can't control. We can't control our critics. There will always be someone that thinks we are doing something wrong or not doing enough, or we didn't do it the way they do it. They're right, we're wrong, we should do it the way they do. Even Jesus had critics. Fortunately, on Judgment Day, we're not going to have to answer to our critics. It really doesn't matter what other people think about you. What matters is what does God think about you? And are you doing your best to please Him? I actually found this illustration this week, and it kind of applies in a situation. An umpire named Babe Babe Pinelli once called Babe Ruth out on strikes. When the crowd booed with sharp disapproval at the call, the legendary Babe Ruth turned to the umpire with disdain and said, there are 40,000 people here who know that that last pitch was a ball, you tomato head. Suspecting that the umpire was going to erupt with anger, the coaches and players braced themselves for Ruth's ejection from the game. But the cool-headed Pinelli replied, maybe so, babe, but mine is the only opinion that counts. God is the umpire. What God says is the only right answer. It doesn't matter what the media says, what the government says, what your friend says, what somebody else says. We need to find out what does God say. And one thing God says is, don't be afraid. Fear does not come from God. We do need to protect ourselves. We need to be safe. But fear, arguing, disagreeing, causing discord, those things don't come from God. You can't control what your critics say or what they think, but you can control how you react back to them. You'll never please everyone. In fact, if your desire is to please God, you're probably going to please very few people here on earth because most people really don't care what God wants. Most people only think of themselves. You'll always have critics, but don't worry about what they think. You can't control them, but you can control yourself, which brings us to the things that we can control. All too often we get distracted by the things we can't control that we lose focus on the things we can. We need to realize I can't do anything with those, but I can control these things, so I will control them. The external conditions of the world sometimes keep us from being consistent in our walk with the Lord and our prayer life and our Bible study. Those are the first things we should do is is if we have to turn off the news or, or stop reading what our friends have to say, we need to concentrate on God, but we get so involved with what's going on out there, we even neglect our time with God. But let me go through three things. I gave you three things you can't control. Let me give you three you can. Number one, we can control our own thoughts. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, this doesn't just apply to our media content or the things that we take in. We think about the things we bring into our mind. It it talks about that. But sometimes we need to consider the thoughts that we have in regards to other people. Okay, so it says, dwell on these things. What kind of thoughts are we having towards other people? Regardless of the choices they're making or what kinds of thoughts they may have towards us, we need to make sure that we never wish harm upon them or harbor hard feelings towards them. In the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul talks about what love is. He says, love always trusts, always believes, always hopes. Yeah, I may not like what they're saying. I may not like what they're doing, but I love them, and I trust it's going to get better, and I trust that they're just being deceived, and they're not seeing clearly. I'm not going to attack them because I have trust. Jesus said that if we have, even have contempt, towards someone. Or if we call someone a fool, it's as bad as murdering them. And I'm pointing to myself here on this one because a lot of times I think, man, that person's really an idiot. That person's a fool. 
when I've done that, Jesus said, it's as bad as if I murdered them. Now, maybe their decision wasn't smart, in my opinion, but again, it's my opinion. Maybe it really wasn't the smartest decision. Okay, so they made a dumb decision. That doesn't mean they're dumb. How many dumb decisions have I made in my lifetime? Don't have contempt towards someone. Don't call them foolish. You don't have to agree with their action. But love them. Accept them. Jesus also said that we should love our enemies and do good to those that do evil towards us. And he's talking about those who deliberately do evil towards us. We're still supposed to love them. We're still supposed to do good for them. In fact, he goes on to say we should pray for them. Pray blessings upon them. Don't pray that something bad is going to happen to teach them a lesson. Pray blessings upon that person. And of course, the best blessing someone can have is to receive Jesus and receive the wisdom that Jesus gives. So instead of attacking them verbally, we need to pray, Jesus, bless them. Introduce yourself to them. And you say, well, that'll never happen to that person. People would have said the same thing about Saul of Tarsus. That guy's too far gone. There's no way he's ever going to be converted. But Jesus revealed himself, and we need to pray that about some of these people that we're having problems with. Jesus, reveal yourself to them. Bless them by giving them your presence. We can't control somebody else's actions towards us. But with God's help, we can control our thoughts towards them. A second thing we can control is our attitude. Usually our thoughts determine our attitude. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 22 through 24 says, you were taught in regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. I love the way that Paul talks here about putting something on. The visual picture is of changing our clothes, taking off the old dirty clothes, taking off the old stinky attitude, and putting on the new attitude that Christ gives us. We have a choice in the matter. We can wear the old clothes, or we can decide to put on the new. We can say, I like this bad attitude that I've got. Well, it's not right. It doesn't make Jesus happy, but you can walk around in your bad attitude if you want to. But Paul instructs us, take off that old stinking attitude. It's time to get rid of that one. Put on the new garments, the new clothes. Put on the attitude of Christ. With God's help, we can control our attitude. And it's going to take God's help for most of us. We can't do that on our own, but we can make a decision. We're going to work on it. We're not going to justify it. We're not going to blame it on somebody else. Say, well, I have a reason to be, be this way. I have a reason to have this kind of attitude because of what they've done, because of what they've said. I deserve to be this way. No, it's wrong. And with God's help, I will get rid of this attitude and take on the attitude of Christ. The third thing that we can control, and there's more than just these three. I'm just giving you three. A third thing we can control is our words. And I've talked about this a little bit already. But our thoughts and our attitude usually come out in our words or expressions. The way I feel comes out of me in some way. In this sense, I'm not just talking about the things that come out of our mouths. Because often we speak more by our actions than by our words. Sometimes we speak volumes by just giving a certain look. Now, most of you know what I'm saying right now, you know. Husbands or wives can look at you a certain way and you know what they're saying even though they didn't really say it. Sometimes it's the look. Right now there are many people who are saying things on social media that they would never say in person. They feel safe hiding behind the keyboard. And often they justify it by claiming they didn't actually say it. They say, I didn't say it myself. I just gave a thumbs up to somebody else who said something. You know, we read something and say, you know, I agree with that. I wouldn't have the guts to say it, but I'm going to like that comment. Well, now everybody's seeing that we like that comment. It's just as if we made that comment ourselves. And maybe it's even a true comment. But if that comment is going to cause someone else to 
not follow Christ, or cause someone else to have a bad attitude, or you know, cause something negative, we should probably not even give that thumbs up. Or sometimes we don't say anything. We think, I didn't say anything. I just posted a meme that I thought was funny. Somebody else put this meme up there and I thought it was funny, so I just posted it. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't even agree with it. We just thought it was funny, so we put it there. But by putting it there, it makes people think we agreed with it. And what we're doing is we're creating an argument that doesn't need to be created. There's an old saying that says, it's better to be silent and be thought a fool than to speak. And I've inserted or type and remove all doubt. Proverbs 17, 28 says, even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. I know James 3, 8 says, no man can tame the tongue, but that doesn't give us an excuse to not even try. Well, James says, I can't control the tongue, so why should I even try? I mean, it's, it's a useless thing, so I'm just going to you know, let it come out because that's just what, the way it is. The reason James said it was to let us know the tongue is dangerous and that we need to be on our guard. We can't just let the tongue do what it wants to do. We need to try, and even though we'll never have complete control, are we even trying to control the things that come from our mouth or from our fingers? We all need to remember the words of Thumper. If you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. Most of what we're facing right now is completely out of our control. We may, not, may or may not agree with those who are in control and calling the shots, but what we need to remember is that regardless of how much control they may seem to have right now, they would still have no authority at all if it weren't for God. You know, we want to blame the Republicans or we want to blame the Democrats. Well, those people wouldn't have put that person in office or, you know, we want to blame somebody else. It's somebody else's fault. This wasn't my decision. It was their decision. They did it. But remember, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 2 says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God, not the Democrats or the Republicans or the voters. Now, we can help with that, but ultimately, they have been placed there by God, or God has allowed them to be there. Consequently, Whoever rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment upon themselves. So since we aren't in control, we need to put our trust in someone else. Ultimately, that trust needs to be placed in God. If we don't agree with the decision that someone else is making, but they are a person of authority... There's not a whole lot that we can do about except pray. God does have the authority to change things. So we need to call on Him. Say, God, I don't like this. Or God, I don't think this is right. Sometimes we can even justify and say, God, this is wrong according to your word. So God, when are you going to do something? But then we need to wait and allow God to do it. We can't change it. Only God can change it. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 2 says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Can we give thanksgiving for those people that we don't agree with? Can we say, God, I'm thankful for this person, even though I don't like their decisions, even though this decision was a bad one, at least in my opinion? I'm thankful for this person? That's tough, isn't it? Petitions, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving should be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. James said, if anyone lacks wisdom, they should ask of God, who gives generously to all. Maybe one of the things we should be praying for those who are making the decisions is that God would give them wisdom. 
I think that most of them really want wisdom. They just don't know where to go for the wisdom. So they're talking to people that they feel are experts and they're interpreting things the way that they think they should be interpreted. But they really want to have wisdom. Most of them are seeking wisdom. Some of them might be seeking it from the wrong place, as I said. In my opinion, at least, they're seeking it from the wrong place. But they really do want to make wise decisions. They're probably not going to listen to me, even though I always have the right answers, right? They should listen to me because I know everything. No, I don't. And I'm glad I'm not in the position they're in. They don't really care what I have to say. So put it out there on Facebook. What I think is not going to change it. It's not going to make anything better. They're not going to read my Facebook post. Now, some of them really don't care what God has to say. Some of them don't even believe in God. But I believe that God is big enough to reveal himself to them anyway. God is big enough to put counselors into their life that even though the individual who's making the final decision may not be a believer, God is big enough to place believers, people who will consult with him into their lives. King Nebuchadnezzar had some advisors who gave Godly advice. Now, he also had some that gave ungodly advice, but Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, they were some of the king's trusted advisors. And a lot of the times, if you read through the book of Daniel, the king liked what they said because it made sense, because it was good, because it came from God. And regardless of whether or not he believed in their God, he listened to the advice that they gave because God had placed them into his life to give godly advice wisdom. God may give them, if we pray for wisdom for for our leaders, God may give them godly advisors. God might give them a dream in the middle of the night or give their wife a dream in the middle of the night. That happened to Pilate. Pilate's wife had a dream and came to Pilate and said, don't do this because I had this dream about this man. They may not ask God for wisdom on their own, but we can pray for them that God gives them wisdom. What would happen if each of us stopped complaining? And again, I'm talking about myself because I've done my share of complaining too. What would happen if each of us stopped complaining about what everyone else is or isn't doing? If we stopped trying to control things that we really ultimately have no control over and instead focused on the things that we can control, what if we focused on our own attitude, our own words, our own actions? And those things that frustrate us, the things that we don't like that other people are doing, what if we stopped talking about them and started praying about them instead? As Christians, we're not supposed to be people who are prone to panic, hysteria, or knee-jerk reactions. Instead, we're people who serve an almighty God, a God who is in control of everything. At any time, our God can speak to this current situation. He can say, peace. Be still. God can just totally eliminate it at any time. We can't, even the doctors can't. The doctors can try to slow it down. They're looking for an antibody or something. They they, they can use some type of a, a, a shot they can give us or something we can do. But God at any time can simply say, that's enough. It's done. I can't control the situation. I can't control what anybody else does. I can't change this current situation, but I can control my thoughts, my attitude, and my words through this situation. And I can turn it over to and trust the one who is ultimately in control. I choose to put my trust in God. And let God do what only He can do.